At midnight, a call will ring on your phone, and it could be a disturbing message about something that's happened in your family. It could be a letter in the mail that you receive and you open up and hear some disturbing news about a loved one. It could be cancer. It could be an accident. It could be a relationship that has just absolutely torn you apart. It could be looking at all of your bills and wondering why I lost my job when I'm 55 to 60 years old because somebody younger can do it for a less expensive cost to the company. We go through the annals of time, we go through the beginning, and we find that it's always been that there will be a crisis that occurs. A crisis will happen. A crisis goes on in our church every single week. Trust me, I deal with that. We're all going to face a crisis. We're all going to have a point in our time when something isn't going the way we thought it should. This message isn't about how God will use the crisis to make you a better Christian, or, and it, that can happen, of course. This message is really, we look at Jesus' methods for evangelizing, and if you study the life of Christ and the gospel records, you can really come across and categorize them in really three compartments. Jesus' methods for evangelizing, as we said last week, one of them, he was a friend of sinners. Those that everybody else had judged, cast out, nobody wanted anything to do with them because of their, quote, lifestyle. Jesus was right there, not accepting their lifestyle, not accepting their sins, but willing to give them an ear and tell them about truth. He was a friend of of sinners. By the way, that title was given to Jesus Christ by his enemies that were religious. We find another case, and we categorize the evangel evangelizing Jesus' methods of evangelizing. The second one we're looking at today, look at the title on the screen. Jesus was always involved in somebody's crisis. He just, they were everywhere. And I think of a church of Jesus Christ, if we are going to be Jesus-style evangelism, we ought to be a friend of sinners, those that are reaching out and want to know truth and that type of thing we talked about last week. The second area we need to look at, look here, is being available for a crisis out in our community. Angie Hogle mentioned a great thing about the Crisis Pregnancy Center in Ohio, that these are women that have, have nowhere to go. Yes, we believe in the pro-life. We're there, but don't ask me to do anything. Available for a crisis. Available. We find in the text two different stories, and this is not an expository detailed message of tearing apart this particular text because I've done that on three separate occasions preaching this, but it will suffice to, I believe, get the point across that Jesus was available for a crisis. By the way, the third area we'll talk about next week is one of the ways Jesus evangelized is he was hospitable. He was always eating with people, talking to people, having food with people. That's why we believe that it's doctrinally correct to say that Jesus was a Baptist because he was always having food, talking about the Lord. Some of you get that. I know people on their couches are ch chuckling big time right now. But anyway, it says here, and he su and she and suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had. This is the woman with the issue of blood, and she comes to Christ, and she had gone. She was the end of her rope. She was, as we call, at her wits' end, and she had tried everything the world had offered. But look what it says, the last part of that verse. But it got worse. It got, didn't didn't help. Ladies and gentlemen, she was ready. She was ready to hear the good news of who Christ was. We find later on in that same text, Jairus' daughter was 
was not yet dead when he met Christ, and we'll go through that in a minute, but yet through some delays that happened of Jesus hanging around, we're not sure how long, dealing with the woman that had an issue of blood, then Jesus says, okay, we've taken care of that one, and he heads out, and guess what? They come to him. While he had spake, there came a ruler of the synagogue's house, certain which said, thy daughter is dead. It's too late. Why troublest thou the master any further? I'd like to preach a message I've simply titled this morning, ladies and gentlemen, being available for a crisis. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for all the parts of this service that have gone so well and wonderful. Lord, we thank you for the testimonies. We thank you for the programs that we have as disciples making disciples, loving God and loving others. As we reach out into a community and give them the good news of the gospel, not religious jargon, but true and sincerity of what Jesus Christ said and what he is, the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray you would use this message, convict that soul that's nearest hell, Save that one that needs a personal relationship with you. And Lord, guide and direct as only you can. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. It's interesting as we look at this particular text, we find that Jesus was always surrounded by people that were in the midst of a crisis. Jesus' style evangelism means you were there for those who were in a crisis. Yes, it can be overwhelming, and yes, people can take advantage of you, and we understand that. Trust me, I know about that one too. But we find in our text today two different stories of two different people from completely different backgrounds, but yet the same Savior that rescued them both. Dr. Tony Evans says this, if we think about it, Doc, if your car falls apart, you go to a mechanic. If your house is falling apart, you go to a repairman. If your clothes are falling apart, you go to a tailor. But where do you go when your life is falling apart? People are ready to receive the gospel and we need to be there and available as a church of Jesus Christ when a crisis hits. The early church, that's all they did. They didn't have the big buildings and all the programs and all the teen group and the youth group and all of the trappings, which there's nothing wrong with that. Everybody in the church was in a crisis. The community was in a crisis. Maybe we need to get back to the Bible. When things are unraveling at a rapid pace and you don't know quite what to do, where do you go? Guess what? Everybody look here. There's a friend that I know, a guy that claims to know Christ. Maybe he's the one I should be talking to. If I was to have everyone in this church this morning to get up and give your personal testimony about how you got saved, assuming that you know Christ is your Savior, there would be a percentage of you, maybe a very high percentage of you, that said, yes, this it happened to me. And there was somebody there that was there for me. By the way, when somebody's going through a crisis, don't grab a big black Bible, throw it at them, and say, God's got a plan. Love on them, be, a, be there for them, and show them the grace of God in your life so you can have the right to be heard later. For thousands of years, God's people have known times of trouble, days of distress, sometimes all too well. Over and over again, you look at the scriptures, they describe the faithful as those who never, who, who didn't see, never, never did, did not see trouble, but as those who cried out to God during a crisis. And God hears our cry. If you go through the New Testament, you see the ten lepers were healed. Only one came back to give thanks, by the way. We see the blind were healed, the raised a widow's son, a Roman soldier demonstrated faith. He accepts a civil, civil, uh, sinful woman. Mary Magdalene is healed of evil spirits. Demon, demon possessed boy is healed. Jesus style evangelism, if we go back to the Bible, was very clear he was available for a crisis. Everybody look here, are you? Too busy. I've got church to do. Well, maybe 
We've got it backwards. Yes, we need a church. Yes, we need to worship. We need to connect. We need to study. We do all of that in our triad of, of, of priorities here. But God help us if we're too busy for the community we're in. Then I would say we're too busy for God. See, Jesus was a friend of sinners. He knew their conditions. He knew their need. He ignored the religious system of the day. He told them what they needed was Himself. He listened to them. Yes, the poor followed Him, the lame, the downtrodden, the sinners of society, the harlots, the tax-cheating publicans as well. And then as we look at today, we find, if we look at the life of Jesus, we see time after time, He was right in the middle of helping someone in a crisis. Now, everybody look here. Just show up at work and open your eyes and say, God, lead me to somebody I can disciple to come to know Christ as their Savior. Lead me. And I guarantee it's going to be somebody that's going through something. I can't tell you how many times people say, Pastor, I got somebody at work. They're going through a divorce. I got somebody at work. They're going through cancer. I mean, Wednesday night, we were reading our prayer, uh, prayer time after our grow group. Just go down the list. How many times are we hearing a phone call on our, on our one call, on our notify quick, and it's about somebody out there that somebody they know is going through a crisis? Are we just praying them or just for the heal? No, we're praying for them to this crisis can be used to bring them to the knowledge of who Jesus Christ is. The big idea today is a crisis opens hearts to God. And if we're going to look at the Bible, and we're going to say we want to be a Bible-believing Baptist church, if you want to say that, You've got to believe that the methods that Jesus used should be used today. The psalmist cries out, I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. How do people cry and, and pray and beseech the Lord? Generally, it's because everybody, look here, something's going wrong. Matthew 7, 7 says this, Ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. And knock and it shall be opened unto you. So let's walk through this just for a moment. Being a babel of a crisis, I believe the outline is in your bulletin, which I believe you could have got one. And it's also on the app as well. You're available. Now the key word there in the outline is you are available. It doesn't mean you have to figure everything out doesn't mean you have all the answers. It doesn't mean you're going to fund whatever they're going through financially. But it does mean you're available to the hurting. Let's walk through this real quickly. And when Jesus was passed over again the ship, he was crossing the Sea of Galilee. Guess what? There's a boatload of people, no pun intended, waiting to receive him. They were already there. Much people gathered unto him, and he was nigh unto the sea. He was right close to the sea. And it says, and behold, there cometh... One of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet. Now, the other gospel records, this is also given in the book of Luke and Matthew. If you would, we're not going to proof text this, but if you look at the other accounts of this, he had been there for a time. He was waiting. He was waiting for Jesus to show up. He knew he was coming. He says, my daughter is sick. She's dying. When are you going to get here? Maybe there's somebody in your life that's waiting for you. No, we're not Christ, but we're Christ bearers. By the way, who else are they going to go to? Verse 23, and he besought him greatly. That besought comes, he really has the connotation. He was pleading, he was begging. The other gospel record said he, he worshipped, he bowed down. He was desperate. Do you know how many desperate people are out there? Seriously? He goes, I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her that she may be healed and she shall live. I've heard. I've heard about you. I've heard what you can do. Now look here. Have people heard about your God from you and will they come to you? A church that has no time for people in a crisis, and I'll make a very dogmatic statement that some may totally disagree with, 
I believe, is a church that is unbiblical. Because you can't find that in the gospel records or even in church history. And Jesus went with him, so he said, okay, let's leave. Big crowd. They start to walk away. And they thronged him. There was a group there. This man was waiting for Christ to come across the lake. The ruler of the synagogue, a leader, no doubt a wealthy man. There was anticipation. Waiting for the arrival. I remember watching, I may have used this illustration years ago, a video when I was a little boy. I was, it was about 1966, 67. Some of you weren't even a mem- even an upcoming thought. You know, you're decades later now. But I was, I was a little boy, and I remember there was this group from Liverpool, England. And they were coming to New York City. And they had the craziest haircuts. It looked like somebody put a bowl in their haircut and cut it around. And they were a group that had a name of a bug. They were called the Beatles. And I remember watching that, and they were showing this video. It was black and white. It was at Shea Stadium in New York City. And the Beatles came in, and they were such anticipation for the Beatles to show up at LaGuardia Airport that when the plane landed from England, and it wasn't even a chartered plane, it was a commercial flight. And back in those days, believe it or not, when you flew a plane, you actually had to get off the plane and walk in the weather. There was none of these control thing. So when the Beatles got off, the airport was packed with people. There were not security screens like we have today. You'd have to show, didn't go through all of that. If you wanted to go to the airport, buddy, you just showed up and they thronged the airport and they were waiting with anticipation for the Beatles to arrive. Now, I'm not equating this at all with that. I wanted to give an illustration. This group was anticipating the arrival of Jesus Christ. There was a group of people there and they were waiting for him to arrive because look here, they had a crisis. They had a crisis. And by the way, we know of these two, no doubt there were more than just these. Matthew says something interesting. Matthew 9, 18, it says, When he spake these sayings, he said unto them, Behold, there came a certain ruler, and he worshipped him. Worshipped him. That has the connotation of bowing down before deity. My daughter is even now dead. This would be later on, of course. They besought him. They searched him out. They implored him. Both Luke and Mark state that Jesus, Jairus fell down at the feet of Jesus. He was desperate. And let me tell you about disciples who make disciples. Disciples are available for desperate people. Luke 8.42 says he had but one daughter. This was her. Jesus notices those that were hurting and desperate. And of all the people he listened to, he listened to Jairus. So Jesus went with him. Number two, being available for a crisis means you have time. You're available, but you've got to spend time. This doesn't mean when somebody's going through a crisis, you kind of say, well, something must be going on in your life. God is judging you. I mean, I don't think anybody would say that with the same mind, especially if somebody's going through that. And maybe it's the case that because of their sinful lifestyle, they're in this crisis. But can I give you a little hint? That's probably not the best thing to say when you first start dealing with somebody. We find there was another woman, as we know the story. He's going to heal Jairus' daughter. He says, okay, let's go. And he gets interrupted. By the way, if you want to be available for a crisis, wait. You will be interrupted a lot. And I think Jairus is probably saying to myself, now look, I've been here. I've been waiting. I've been praying. And we're headed. We start out. And all of a sudden, you're stopping to help this woman. You don't see him saying that. (coughs) She had an issue of blood, 12 years. By the way, when you talk about an issue of blood, that makes her unclean. She's untouchable. She can't get near anybody. And the interesting part is, and she had suffered many things of physicians and spent all that she had. She had been taken advantage of, no doubt. 
women in the area that time and the social structure, especially women that were deemed unclean, were the worst of the worst. She was probably an outcast. She had nothing. Her hair was probably full of lice and not taken care of. She was an unclean person and somehow she slipped into this crowd and it says there that many physicians that would not be what we call doctors today you can equate that if you want to people that were part of healing possibly even those in the religious system had spent and she she basically had been ripped off and look here it didn't it not only did it not work it got worse now look at there Let's say this together. When she had what? Heard. The people hear of Jesus from you and me. Or do they hear about politics? Or do they hear about sports? Or do they hear about fishing? Now, why do you want to hear about fishing? I don't know. But why would you? <laughs> that was geared toward one person here in this church. <laughs> well, maybe two. And there's nothing wrong with those things. But what? Look here. Every eyeball on me. What are you known for in your circle? It said when, she, when he had heard of Jesus in the press and touched his garment. Sometimes we're too busy. Jesus could have said, hey, I've got Jairus' daughter to deal with. Get out of the way. By the way, you're kind of ugly. You're unclean. Now, she stealthily or secretly sneaked up, we know that, and touched his garment. Many people believe the reason she did that was hoping that others wouldn't notice and she would be, because she was unclean. And that wasn't good. Her money was gone, her disease was gaining on her, and she had one chance to see Jesus Christ. She had tried everything. By the way, when Christ gets real, I think you'll be available for a crisis. Do we know to these people? Evangelism, I believe, biblical evangelism, in many ways, begins when people are at their wit's end. Pride is gone, right? You get saved because you throw yourself at the mercy of Christ. You say, God, it's all you. It has nothing to do with me. I accept you as my Savior. It's all yours. And maybe, maybe something has to happen in your life and in my life before we ever get to that point. It's not, I'll try the Jesus thing. I've got my fire insurance. Yes, I came forward at a revival meeting or a camp meeting. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with that. You can surrender your life there. But don't ask me to be a disciple. Don't ask me to be a disciple maker. Don't ask me to live a life differently, to be holy, separate, sanctified, as I grow in the life of Christ. That's just too hard. We don't find that in the Bible. When you look at the life of Jesus, we see time after time, He was right in the middle of this stuff. Jesus' style evangelism means being available for and helping in a crisis. <coughs> This takes a dramatic pivot for a lot of folks in churches as well. And programming and budgeting. This means getting out of the bubble and into the reality of a hurting culture that is really hurting. And not financially necessary. Several years ago, this has been, boy, it's been a long time, over 20, I was asked to campaign for a guy at our church that was running for office. And that was an eye-opening event. And he said, we'll go to different neighborhoods and put a flyer, vote for blah, 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 this person. And, you know, he was a good conservative Republican, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, we were excited about this guy. So we decided, well, we'll we know him. He goes to our church. So I started going door to door in this particular neighborhood in New Jersey. Now, remember, New Jersey is not like Erie. Erie is Mayberry RFD. New Jersey is... New Jersey, right? You ever seen The Sopranos? That's probably not a good show. To I haven't seen it either, but heard it's bad. But that's New Jersey, all right? So he watches that? No, I really don't. Have we ever seen it? No. Just be truthful. 
We have never seen it. God strike me dead. I've never seen it, but I heard it's bad. It's about, you know, the, the different gangs that their last names ends with a vowel or something like that. I don't know. But anyway, so I was going door to door, and here's one thing I noticed. I could hear yelling at about every third or fourth door. And there were a lot of people whose homes were not happy. Yelling and screaming. And they would come to the door and they'd say, I'm so-and-so. And And it wasn't door-to-door evangelism, which is almost impossible to do in New Jersey. I guess you could try it, but even political campaigning was hard. But I went and I handed, you would hand the guy and they'd go, and I could say, he would smile when he came to the door, or she, but their house was a train wreck. And for some reason, when I was putting this together and putting the final touches on this just the other day, I think it was yesterday or day before, I started thinking about there's a lot of homes in a crisis, but you would never know it until you get to know them. Rolling up our sleeves and getting dirty is generally not a part of what we like to do. We're too busy getting the next church service ready and the next program so people will keep coming. I'm speaking from a pastor standpoint. Well, they got to be happy. they got to like it. As Rome burns, we entertain. I say that to my shame, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with what we're doing, but sometimes maybe our priorities need to be shifted just a little. Meanwhile, the community has yawned at us. They've checked out and ignored them. We've ignored our own mission field. And I would say in most communities in the United States of America, if you would get out of your bubble, you'll find that the church is irrelevant and not important. Why bother? Yes, we'll have Bible conferences and revivals. We'll preach to the converted and talk how bad the community is, how bad the culture is, and how great things used to be. But yet, that does nothing for the people in our community to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm not saying that's anything wrong with that. There's a time for that. Is there any wonder our community has checked out and views the church as irrelevant and really something from the past? They say if this trend keeps up, most church buildings will be used for two things in the future. Restaurants torn down are relics of history about how the United States used to be a religious country. See, we find in Mark chapter 5, verse number 27, for she said, if I may but touch his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway, the, he, she did. It says in verse 28, I may be whole. That word whole means sozo. It comes from the Greek word means saved. For she said, if I may but touch his clothes, I shall be made whole. <coughs> James Fawcett Brown, a commentator I use a lot, says this about this situation. It says, regarding what she said, according to ceremonial law, the touch of anyone having this disease, which the woman would have defiled the person she touched. Most people believe that she had a recollection of, that, recollection of this, maybe, so she stealthily approached him in the crowd behind touching him by the hem of his garment. And we find in verse number 28, the word sozo is saved, shall be whole, completely healed. And verse 29, and straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she <coughs> felt in her body that she was healed of the plague. And Jesus immediately, Jesus knew what was going on. He's God. Knowing himself, the virtue had gone out of him, turned about in the press and said, who touched my clothes? He knew who touched her. It was to get her to articulate the fact. And the disciples said unto him, thou seest the multitude throng in thee. How can you say who touched you? By the way, they're all touching you. And he looked around to see her that had done this thing. Can you imagine that? Jesus Christ's eyes peering down and says, you touched me. Now, here's what she could have done. Here's the, here's the glory of salvation. And she could have said, no, I didn't touch you. Well, Christ knew it. But she knew it was a change. The woman, fearing and trembling. Yes, she was fearing and trembling because she just made him unclean, right? Knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. 
And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. What made her whole? Faith. How did that faith come about? Everybody look here. Her crisis. Her crisis brought her to Christ. That word whole is the sozo again. Save. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. The third one we'll go through. Let's get back to Jairus just for a moment. We'll quickly run through this. Being available also means that, guess what? Look at the screen and please pay attention to this. If you don't want to get offended and you don't want your feelings hurt, just ignore being available for crisis because you will be ridiculed and you will be offended. Right? So he goes on, he, the woman at this is healed, the woman with the issue of blood, and yet he spake, there came, so his, he's wasting his time, and I don't know how much time took place, I'm not going to overanalyze this and try to make something in scripture that's not there, but we do know he spent some time with her, and while he was there, they came from the rule of the synagogue's house, which said, don't bother, your daughter's already dead, Jesus, don't bother, she died, too late, while you were here with her, possibly, she died. Now, here's the point I want to bring up. When you start helping people in a crisis, they're going to be people that are Christians that know Christ is their Savior. And looky here, please, looky here. Is that a word, looky? Looky here. I'm from Georgia. Where's Susie's not here? She's at the next service, right? Why bother? Why do you bother with them? They're not worth it. I have a grandson... I mean, I don't want to get, that was adopted. And he was in an abusive home before Dave and Trisha adopted him. And all he was told was he would never amount to anything. He's only seven, eight years old. Why bother? Because his scores weren't what they should have been. Aren't you glad Christ doesn't treat us that way? Why bother? She's already dead. Now, the offenses get worse in this text because Jesus says, I'm going on. I'm not even going to listen to you people. As, Jesus, as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the rule of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. That had to be so encouraging because the dad just heard the news. His daughter's dead. And he says, because of you ridiculing people, and because of this negative spirit I have, by the way, God has a way of removing those kind of people from where God is working in a, in a, in a situation of hurting and suffering. He says, I'm just going to take the big three with me, Peter, James, and John. They need to listen to this. They need to see this. I'm not saying the other disciples were critical at all. And he cometh to the house of the ruler. He finally gets there. We don't know how far that is. It would have been a while. And seeth the tumult. In other words, it's their weeping and wailing. Most commentators believe that it had been at least a period of time. Could have been over a day or so. so and they'd already hired professional mourners. By the way, that was very common then. So whatever's going on, there is a bunch of noise going on. Weeping and wailing greatly. And when he came and he said to him, why make this ado? In other words, what in the world are you, what's the commotion about? I do, I don't know what that means, but what's the commotion about? This girl is not dead, but sleepeth. You know what they did? You know, did you read the text? You want to get made fun of? Try to do something for God and have people laugh at you like they did. Look at the next verse. And they laughed into scorn. You know what Jesus did to those people? Get them out of here. Sometimes everybody look at here, look, look at here. Everybody look here. When you get ridiculed, and people like that, just get away from them. Negative spirits. God can't, you know, you're too busy for that. You've got too much with your family, blah, blah, blah. You know, God's put some, you know what? Other people can, that's what the social structure is for. And yes, they help, no doubt about it. For crying out loud, we are working so hard as a church and, and trying to get not just into the community, but get into the lives of people because we believe, I believe, the church believes, our leadership believes that discipleship can only take place as if we get involved in other people's lives. 
It's not liturgical church worked all over again. We just sprinkle everybody, say a bunch of words, say some Gregorian chants and we're good. We don't believe that, right? But sometimes we act like that. And he takes the father and the mother and the damsel that were with them and they entered into where the damsel was lying. So guess what? There's just three people. By the way, these guys are okay now. There's no more laughing anymore, this group. And he took the damsel by the hand and said, Talitha Kumai, which is being interpreted, damsel, I say, arise, get up and walk. And she did. Sometimes we get ridiculed. Sometimes we try to do things to help people and even the people we're helping don't understand it. And we can never do enough. It's always like you're one more thing and then if you don't do the one thing they want you to do, they, I understand that. Been there, read, done that, read the book. But it doesn't mean we don't invest ourselves in the lives of people. See, the modern day church movement has big buildings, big cities, Great shows, if you want to call it, services, worship centers, and done all of this to proclaim the Word of God. There's nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with that. But if that all is a church, then you're nothing but an entertainment center to be fed over and over again while Rome burns. And I want to tell you, I don't think anybody wants that. Many will malign and misunderstand, misunderstand and ridicule, but some will see Christ through our actions. So I close with this. First of all, are you saved? Do you know Christ? Are you available? When we have a meal train, is your name the first one on there? You can't wait to get to help somebody either in our church or outside the church? Or is that something you're just too busy for? And I'm not saying that everybody needs to do the meal train. That's just one area. Do your children see you involved in other people's lives as they grow up? Or is it all about what's in it for me? I say that to my shame. Now I want you to look at the second question and then we're going to pray. And then the third. Everybody look at it. I want you to make it very personal. Who? That somebody on planet earth that has a heart beating right now. Who is the one you know in a crisis? Who is it? I think if I was to, everybody in this room should know someone. Why don't you pray about how you can be available? Maybe it can be just taking them a meal. Maybe it can be telling them you love them. Maybe it can be checking up on them and having the opportunity. By the way, look here, and I am done. We have to earn the right to be heard. Don't you go in there blasting them with the Bible if you've never spent time to get to know who they are. That is such a turnoff in our culture. But you let them get to know who you are, and then they will be receptive to what God's Word says. And lastly, I say this to you. God bless you if you're here. We're all going to go through it. As I look across this auditorium, I can honestly say almost everybody in this room that's been here a period of time, I can identify when you were in a crisis at one time. Some of you are in a crisis right now. Let's pray together. Can we pray? Dearly Father, we thank you for this time.